Hello and welcome to Project Passion episode three, the podcast made to help you find your passion and turn it into a successful business or career. As I said, episode three, this week we have Kevin Maxwell on the show. And Kevin, if you don't already know, is an open water swimmer. He's a scuba diver. He's a musician. And he's actually in his last year at BIM Dublin um, this year. So Kevin, do you want to introduce yourself um, and tell everyone who you are and why you're on the show? All right, Johnny, thanks a million for having me. Um, yeah, so basically, you had it all there. Uh, I play guitar, I swim a lot, and yeah, I'm a simple man. That's pretty much it, so. <laughs> pretty much it, no problem. Uh, so do you want to just kind of explain to people um, about your swimming um, and sort of just touch on that there and what it is you do? Yeah, so basically, um, after we met there a couple of years ago, uh, I went back to, we met in holidays, obviously, and you were working in a dive center, and I went to, yeah. for a dive at the center. I came home and, and joined a, a scuba diving club, and then from there, kind of dished the scuba gear and went for a swim one day with the lads and never went back. So <laughs> <laughs> from there, the swims got, got longer and, and longer and longer. And I ended up doing um, a 20 kilometer swim there uh, in August of 2017. Yeah. yeah. In just under seven. So that was, um, maybe that was the peak of my swimming career. But uh, yeah, that was it. That was it for me. That was the swimming. That was it. Um, and yeah, as you said there, when we first met, um, it was... We worked out the other day, it was three years ago, last week or something like that there. Uh, it was the first time we met and I was, as Kevin says, in Ibiza, I was working in a dive center called Punta Dive, Dive Star International. Um, and Kevin came for a dive and we, what, you were there for what, maybe three, three days? Maybe I seen you for two, three days. Um, I was there, I spent four or five days at the dive center overall within the two weeks I was in, I was in Ibiza for, but yeah made good friends anyway <laughs> yeah and that was it and we've been well touch and go in contact ever since really i think um because i remember you doing that swim um that massive one as well i remember you were going out for it um so obviously the reason you're on the show the main reason is your music um and so do you want to kind of explain to people sort of uh what you do in college and explain sort of where you go to college and explain that people don't live in ireland as well yeah cool so uh i go to bim uh, it's the british institute of modern music and they just have a, happen to have a campus in in dublin and um yeah it's a four-year degree in commercial modern music and i'm specializing in guitar you can take the course in four streams five streams sorry uh guitar bass drums vocal and songwriting so obviously i'm a guitar player so i took the course in guitar and then um, yeah going to my final year this year so I should be hopeful on next year. I have a have a degree in, under my belt, so nice to see how it goes. And um, what is your degree called then when you come out of there? What's that actually uh, based in? Uh, in Ireland, it goes. It's um, a Bachelor of Arts Honours degree in Commercial Modern Music. Okay, nice. So obviously, uh, I know what you've been up to. But you want to kind of explain to people uh, about your gigging and about sort of what you're doing out and about um, professionally within music. So um, yeah, I started off in in bands back in the day, like just especially when I came to college first, kind of, you know, you, you meet all, all every other musician in the college and you kind of form bands straight away and you can get out and get playing. So first and second year, I was in a good few bands, three or four gigging a lot. And then, um, yeah, I kind of took a break down in third year, just gone. And then obviously with every now, there's no gigs happening at all. So, but uh, it was nice to take the break from gigging and I got into teaching instead. So um, I was teaching piano, I was teaching guitar in a, just a local school of music around the corner from my house. Uh, then uh, with my ex-partner, she was a vocalist in the college and we used to have a little duet that we used to play in. And um, yeah, we used to play pub gigs and just get gigs like that and try and get by day to day, you know, yourself. Like. Of course. So obviously uh, this is something you're, you're doing a degree in it. Um, where is it you see yourself sort of getting to within the next sort of five, 10 years? Is it strictly teaching or do you want to continue to perform and try to actually, you know, maybe get signed, record and produce stuff that way as well? Uh, I'm not an artist. I don't write my own music as such anymore. Uh, I did when I was in bands. We used to write riffs and, and songs together and stuff. But um, at the minute, I'm, I'm focused on teaching and I'm focusing on kind of being a sideman for other artists. So whether that's uh, session recording work, well, at, at the minute it's from home, but uh, before coronavirus and all that happened, um, I was hitting in studios with artists and stuff and trying to just be a working man, really, you know, just being a working guitar player. And then between that and teaching, um, I was applying for wedding bands and trying to get into wedding bands and stuff before coronavirus, but then obviously everything shut down. So yeah, that wasn't for, wasn't the big year, but you know yourself. Yeah. I'd like to try the cruise ships. That'd be a good thing I'd like to try. But um, yeah, kind of see how it goes after all this, if they even come back or not, we don't know yet. But. Yeah. 
I know that's going to be a bit of a nightmare, especially obviously with coronavirus. Um, that's it's obviously up in the air completely. There's not even like you can start setting yourself up for it because you don't even know where the industry is going to go to within the next three months. No one knows at all. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, um, as you said, within music, working man and music, do you think that's obviously something maybe people don't realize is you don't just have to be a singer songwriter musician recording putting out albums or a teacher is do you want to kind of explain what the other sort of job roles you can really go for in the music industry as you say maybe doing wedding stuff like that and also doing recording stuff for other artists at the same time a funny story actually before we get into that i remember with my guidance counselor in college like kind of career guidance and i was like oh i want to be a musician and she laughed at me <laughs> and she was like kev you realize you're be Ed Sheeran you know that and I was like yeah but there's other things to do and she says Kev just study business like everyone else and I was like nah <laughs> <laughs> your guidance people don't really know what the industry is about the music industry you know yeah. but um, yeah that's the backstory and in terms of the music industry there's so, there's so many different ways you can go into it like you know you could be an artist and put out your own music and have your own as an artist like just a solo artist or you could be a roadie and just be just be as important as anyone else in the industry you know be a driver for like Beyonce or someone like you know like these people are just as important in the music industry and people don't realize that at all like there's professional chefs working in the music industry going on tour with major artists as the catering staff you know yeah see and the only reason I know about that is there's a tv show which I don't know if you've seen called Roadies um it's an American show yeah, so you'd like it, man. It's an um, American TV show called Roadies, but it's basically based on the Roadies. And they and it's basically there with this band on tour, but it shows very little of the band. Like, it's not focused on them. It's focused on all the people in the background. I mean, it's got some good actors in it. Um, there's an English actor you'd know. Uh, MGK, is that's the reason I watched it. Machine Gun Kelly um, is one of the main characters in it. Um, but it's a fantastic show for showing that sort of thing and the amount of people it takes to put on like one gig on a tour and the amount of people like I say bus drivers, light and sound, all the techs that have to go and put the rig up and stuff like that there. Like there is so many more jobs within the industry. Exactly. That's exactly what I was gonna say. Like even like if you think about let's say Ariana Grande or Beyonce or any big name and you think, oh, 150 euro to go and see her in whatever arena, like, that's so expensive. But when you realise that she had an office block full of people working for her to organize that gig along with a hundred other gigs that year. Like, can you imagine 25 dancers, makeup crew, doctors, catering staff, light technicians, uh, drivers, Arctic lorries, petrol, everything that goes into it, uh, uh, flights, passport people, like the whole lot, like there's such a huge, huge, huge crew of people to be able to organize and get on the road for a six month tour. Like world tour or something like that something huge like there's so many different jobs to go into it to make that whole thing work and if any piece of that puzzle is missing the whole thing just collapses so yeah of course well i mean we had that with uh dan tate last week when he was talking about the logistics of the race industry and pretty much the same thing where like they have to obviously go months in advance to get things sent over and to get like you know catering trucks and you know mechanical trucks and the new uh, the cars and people and there's so many things that go into it that people just really don't realize that's where the cost is and that's where the real manpower goes into getting all that prepared yeah exactly oh same here with the music industry man like there's so much behind the scenes that people don't realize you know definitely yeah so obviously you, you mentioned it um there to start and obviously we talked about it last week as well but obviously teaching um is where you're kind of at the minute um and you said you were kind of thinking about maybe going down the online teaching sort of route um have you have you looked into that anymore or is it something you've contemplated uh it's something i thought about like you like every single youtube video i watch there seems to be someone selling a guitar course you know like I, I, maybe that's just the how the algorithm's working for me but uh yeah, it's it's definitely something that people are doing a lot of now recently in the past four or five years is selling courses online. And it seems like a great way to to do it and market yourself as a working musician, as a teacher. And it nearly turns into passive income when you have all the work done to just have it sell, you know, and, and just keep up with the marketing and not have to physically teach in person and put those hours in in person with the students. But um, I don't know, I think there's something missing with that with the online that kind of face to face teaching is something that I really like. You now, having been able to see the, the student in person grow as a musician, you know, I think that's really interesting and really um, rewarding to see. But if you're selling it to people online, you don't get to see that, you know, kind of you're doing the work, but you're not seeing the reward, you know? Yeah, I get it. Um, you, I mean, the, probably the way you could probably 
again, it's not as personal as it would be face to face, but sort of taking the uh, like Zoom call almost like we're doing here for this podcast and kind of physically doing it that way. Um, I get what you mean though about like, you know, you buy a course, you watch 35 videos, but you never actually speak to the person once, like it makes no sense. Whereas I guess obviously what you're talking about is more personable. And I mean, to be honest, it, it puts the value up, doesn't it? Obviously, if you're getting a more one-to-one experience, that person has to put time out with you. You can charge a lot more for it, and also it markets better as well because you're allowed. You're sorry, it markets better because if you're putting out free content on YouTube, you're absolutely bumping up your free value. Then it makes it even more reason for people to come across and pay for that one-to-one to get actually up close with you. Then exactly, and then even with like online courses, like how do you ask questions? You know, like that's how you learn is from your mistakes, but no one's telling you if you're making mistakes or not, you know, because you're, you're not in the room with the teacher. Exactly. You can't even get your finger correction. Like, because I know, obviously, I told you I've been learning guitar since the start of lockdown and little things like, you know, okay, yeah, move that finger this way. Make sure you're holding that tight and you just check an individual thing where if you're sitting with someone, they can go, you don't know, you know, move, but if you're off the camera, <laughs> yeah. you kind of have to look at it and go, yeah, that, that's all right. Exactly, yeah. And uh, like everyone has their own way of doing it and everyone has their own kind of teaching methods. But then um, that's definitely something I found like even with like my own teachers and stuff in college and outside of college, like doing the Zoom classes and stuff, they're great and all, but like when you have twenty five students on a Zoom call with one teacher and there's lag and, and there's internet and then every other variable that could go wrong does go wrong. It's just uh, it's not as effective as as being in person like that's what i really enjoy i think one-to-one teaching and, and in small groups is definitely something i do when i when i kind of get out of college and when we're out to be in face face with people again you know yeah exactly but uh, i'll see you know i think when we said about it the other week we were talking about uh the, the fact that you don't actually need to be some sort of incredible professional guitar player just to teach someone how to play guitar because people really will buy into the personality of who's teaching them more than sort of they're the best guitar player in the world yeah definitely it's, it's, if, if you like a teacher you'll do good in their class if you don't like a teacher you won't do good in their class you know it's definitely personalities personality of the teacher is definitely hugely important of course um so have you got yourself a plan set up then for your next obviously coronavirus probably screwed it a little bit uh but have you got some sort of plan of how you're going to then build yourself back up now when this ends and sort of go for this go for that and build towards something and the past couple of months once I've spent a lot of time practicing and kind of expanding my knowledge, expanding my repertoire, kind of get, get playing a lot. You know, when you're in college and you're commuting and busing and everything else, you don't have a lot of time to practice. But for the last few months, I've had nothing but time to practice. So that's been hugely helpful. But um, I suppose after lockdown, as things get opening again, like the pubs are back open, so there should be gigs happening again. It's just a matter of getting booked for them, you know. But um, at the moment, I think just keep, uh, keep practicing for a moment, you know. But the next while, maybe if I can get back teaching, back in september when the schools are back open hopefully i should be able to get back into teaching again who knows how it's going to go but um between that and then gigging get back out gigging again on the more so on the professional scene the wedding scene stuff like that like doing the original stuff is great it's good fun you're with your mates but um you need to earn your bread as well you know what i mean so exactly and continue recording is why I, I do well for that so um yeah just keep just keep tipping away man just keep grinding you know yourself there's no at the minute just especially with everything you can't really have a set goal but uh the way things are going on but uh just keep tipping along just keep working keep grinding and keep playing keep enjoying it that's the main thing man as long as you're having fun you're doing well you know of course so i, I didn't even ask you this beforehand but off the top of your head what would your five five might be too many what's your three top tips for new guitar players for brand new for students brand new yeah what would be your like top three tips for guitar playing and um, hire me to teach it <laughs> no. um, <laughs> uh, let me think um, enjoy yourself just have fun you know play what you want to play like if you're huge into metal music there's no point in you going to study in jazz you know um, if it, and if and vice versa you know definitely just play what you enjoy that's the main thing yeah and um, that's that, that's the only thing that matters really just enjoy yourself that's what it's there for music is for is for fun music is about passion music is about enjoying yourself and expressing yourself so uh definitely yeah just just have fun <laughs> that's it play the songs you like learn like well that's what i do obviously because like all the i love country music and that's pretty much all i play to be honest like i play acoustic versions of some other songs so there's like um 
I don't even know what you would call it. It's like a pop, pop punk rap sort of type thing. But I play like the acoustic scaled down version. Um, but for the most part, like pretty much all country music I play. No one else understand. No one else would know the songs, so I can never play them for anyone. But I feel great when I sit and play them by myself. That is, man. As long as you're enjoying yourself, man, that's all that matters. And people, like you said earlier, personality. If someone's watching you playing guitar and you're so getting into it, enjoying, picking up that, and enjoy it just from seeing you enjoy it, to, to to listen to, play songs you like, and just have fun. That's the main thing, you know. That's what it's all about. So. Exactly. So, um, with your college, obviously, um, BIM Dublin, what was your, I, did you assume you had to go get your GCSE in music first? And do you want to kind of explain just sort of uh, your, your path, sort of what you chose to get there and sort of what you've done throughout it and sort of just explain more about your college experience with it? Yeah, in Ireland, obviously, it's different. The education system is different than like where you're from. But uh, basically, we have like, how do I explain it? Our like GCSEs, are called the junior cert, but you take like, I can't remember, like you do it when you're like 14, 15, and it's like 10 or 11 exams in June at the end of the year. And um, after that, you go into your leaving cert. So then you do two more years of school, and then you should be doing that when you're like, I don't know, 17, 18, about that. So then you take like six, seven subjects. So obviously I took music and that. And uh, you have to do like English, Irish, maths, and you know, the, the boring ones. But <laughs> but then yeah, yeah, so then I, I obviously took music. And then I was like, I didn't have an interest in anything else. Like I didn't want to do business. I didn't want to do any science or anything like that. I wasn't into English or anything like that. Like, you know, so I knew if I was going to college, it was going to be for music. So um, I ended up doing, kind of taking a year off and wanted to decide between going into music production or into playing and performing. So to kind of make my mind up about that, I enrolled into a one-year course. It was called a post leaving cert course, and it was in um, Dunboyne College. So it was a one-year course in both performance and production so it kind of gave me an insight into both industries and then with the knowledge again from that i ended up applying for for bim and and getting in so yeah just for for performing mainly so yeah awesome so um bim does it have so uh, only because i i don't know i've never asked you this before bim obviously with your course is there other types of music course that they offer or is it strictly just the course you do and they just churn out people in that one degree so they have a couple of one-year courses in business and stuff like that. Uh, I'm not actually too sure. They're bringing out a master's in, in BIM Dublin this year for, for this September coming. I think it's going to be the first year they're offering the math. The course is called. It's, it's just a master's degree. But um, yeah, they have a couple of different courses, mainly music production and then the performance one, which I'm in. So yeah, they everything. Awesome. So um, obviously, if someone wanted to go and do what you're doing they wanted to be gigging they want to get into teaching they want to, what would your sort of tips for people be in terms of how to start their journey into the music industry and how to sort of get their foot in there just be in the room be, go to every gig find every open mic find every gig go to go to every event that where there's music and just talk to people because uh, you could be the best guitar player in the world sitting in your room but if no one knows who you are <laughs> it doesn't matter doesn't matter <laughs> you know I mean? does it yeah so it's all about who you know, it's all about contacts, it's all about networking. Same as any industry, I guess. But um, yeah, definitely just go to gigs and, and, and meet people, get into bands, play shows, just do everything. Just have fun. Again, that's the main thing. But if you want to be a work musician, definitely um, be in the room, network, and just make contacts is the main thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. And that, I mean, that's, that's honestly such a key theme. Um, already on this podcast when we're talking about people's passions um all three people yourself now have all said you know it, it's networking like especially with these things that we've had like so far you know we've had Layla Evelyn's designs we had Dan who works in the motorsport industry um we have you so like people are doing very sort of niche things and it really is down to the market and then making sure you know people's name people know your name and being able to sort of actually connect dots together yeah, definitely. That's exactly it. You, you need in any industry, it's the same. Like you know, uh, definitely, just need to be out there and and be active. And actually, the first ever class I had in BIM, and um, it was like a Monday morning, or whatever. And someone asked like the same kind of question. It's like, what was the what's the biggest tip you have? And one of our teachers, I won't I won't say his name, but he says, just don't be a dick. Just be sound. That was the biggest. Just just don't be a dick. And as you get on in the music industry and you start going out and going to gigs and you really how you really realize how important that is to just be sound 
and just be nice to everyone, you know. Because word gets around, especially in Ireland, it's a small country, you know. So uh, just be cool and just be the best person you can, you know. <laughs> exactly. Well, see, uh, so I only find this out, actually, after me and you had last had a phone call. Um, so this one here is going to pick your brain a bit, so because you might not even remember who I'm talking about. So, you know, um, back when we had Skullfish, when we started Skullfish Apparel, which Kevin is wearing in the video right now. Kevin was my very first brand ambassador when I started my clothing brand like three years ago. Um, but basically, do you know? Do you remember Ross the drew the logo and drew our font for that? My friend. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Right. Do you know he's a verified singer on Spotify? You were joking me. No way. Yeah, on, right. So I messaged no him the other day. Way. I wanted a new, so I wanted a beat for the podcast. So I messaged him. I'm, so yeah, you're going to, a fresh beat coming for the podcast. But I basically messaged him like, yeah, you make beats. Can, can you sort me out? And he's like, yeah, yeah, go look at my uh, online. So I went on and I was like, These, this isn't a fucking beat, mate. Like, this is tracks, like full tracks. Oh, what? That's so cool. I swear to God, mate, he's dropped like four singles so far. He's got a, a six speed spring in Beijing and uh, what's it going to be? On, and one other one. Well, I can't remember. But he's dropped these four singles. He's got an album on the way. He's still recording like mad. But honestly, I, I, I'm going to show you. I'm going to send you a link to this after the podcast, right? Uh, his song, um, What's It Going to Be, right? Isn't like a normal song. Do you, know when you, do you, know, you know as a musician when one of your friends goes, yeah, I've recorded a song and you go, all right, let me hear it. And you're like, yeah, go on. That's all right. So, <laughs> I played this song and just lost my mind. Like, Oh man, I love, I've I had love it on, that feeling. I've had I'm it so hard. for like five days. It's like my summer banger now, so it is like set. Oh, it's just no better feeling than finding an absolute banging tune like that. Like, And it's my best mate. <laughs> just putting it out. Oh, that's just, Oh, better, man. I get that all the time because all my friends are musicians. So, I, like, people are sticking out songs left, right, and center. I'm like, oh, my friends are so talented. What the hell? Like, you know, just putting out bangers every other week. Like, it's just so cool. It's mad, mate, when I realize. And I mean, to be fair, anyone that's watching this podcast, anyone that likes me enough to watch this podcast, <laughs> <laughs> will have already seen on my Instagram story that I've literally had that song on my story five days in the past week, I think. Like, I, I can't stop listening to it. It's in the background of everything I'm doing. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick a link to it below it in this video um, anyway, and below the podcast as well, because it's fire. Um, but yeah, man, it's one of them ones where you kind of, you don't know someone's doing something and then they come out of nowhere. And apparently, like, so I don't know on your take on it, but in Northern Ireland, apparently, the, from his point of view, the rap scene is like properly taken off. Um, it's getting a really big sort of, underground sort of um culture around it oh definitely yeah yeah I, I, there's a huge like hip-hop scene in ireland as well like in dublin especially like just like artists coming out left right and center like uh, actually a, a guy i went to school with i think he's a couple of years younger than me i don't even know the guy's name but um i came out on instagram just everyone was sharing it i was like oh i recognize that dude and it turns out he's just like a crazy singer and like no one ever knew and he never shared it with anyone and now he's kind of just trying to um, pursue music but it just goes to show, like, there's, there's so much talent on the ground that people like, don't even know about, you know. That goes back to marketing, you know. You, you need to just, the networking, you know, you need to just be in the room and, and let people know you're here, you know. Especially when you're in, like, in the music industry and, like, you walk past someone and they're in, like, especially, like, going up and down to college on, like, Francis Street, where it is in Dublin. Like, you see people in, like, famous Irish bands just coming in to do a masterclass. Like, that's one of the best things I've been. It's, like, they have, like, these huge, huge industry names come in like people from like well-known bands you know and they come in and just do a masterclass about their career and, and and yeah oh it's just mental man it's so cool that's incredible that is actually we never had that in my uni so oh we had a my favorite one was oh this is a crazy story man. you're not gonna believe this when i was in the first year i was in i think it was it was about november i was in only in college a couple of months and it was just masterclass uh, it was Josh Homme from Queens of the Stone Age. Oh, the singer from Queens shit. Of the Stone Age. That's my reaction. Yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> I was like, oh, well, I'm getting into this. So I, I didn't get a place in the masterclass, right? But I waited outside the door the whole time, waiting for him to call me. He was playing a show that night in, in uh, the Tree Arena in Dublin, like his band was. So uh, I waited outside and just hoping that there was a seat ready for me. Like if, if there was a seat like uh, empty, so I could just like sneak in and, and yeah, sit down, yeah. right? They let me in. I don't know how I did it, but I got in, right? <laughs> it's only in like the library of college. 
So he was just sitting there. And uh, yeah, so we were all sitting there. There's about 100 of us in the room. And uh, he's just sitting there with a mic, just telling horror stories of tour buses breaking down in the Alps and just crazy shit. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> just like just telling jokes and telling stories. We were just asking questions. Oh, what did you mean by this lyric? You know, it's just really one to one kind of. You're like 10 meters sit- sitting away from him, you know. But uh, but afterwards, um, he was like, like, the way to get out of the building, there's two ways out of this room, but you need to come, like, connect back out the front door kind of way, right? Yeah. So uh, he went to the back door and was like, the only way out of this building is, is at the front door. So I, like, flew out the room. And I was like, yo, Josh, any free tickets for tonight? And he was like, yo, here you are, man. What? What? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he just handed me two tickets to his gig that night. And I, I couldn't believe it. Like, I was absolutely shaking. I don't know what's more shocking, the fact that he gave you tickets or the fact that you had the balls to just go, oi, any free tickets for tonight, mate? <laughs> You know me, man. I could just talk to Pete out of the song. Or that he had two tickets in his back pocket to just go, yeah, there you go. It was him, like him and a couple of his, like, you know, the crew or whatever, his just drivers and stuff, management, whoever it was. But um, yeah, I was like, oh, any free tickets going? And he was like, yeah. And I, I was like, me and my were sitting here. It's like, <laughs> we're going tonight, man. <laughs> That's mad. That's oh, well it's a real, man. Oh, craziest day of my life, man. So good. I think my biggest gig was. 2,000 people in the National Concert Hall when I was like, it was like with school choir, it doesn't count. But, <laughs> but uh, it doesn't matter if you're playing to a huge crowd like that or you're playing to 10 of your mates in some shitty dive bar DIY gig. Like, you know, you need to put in that energy. You know, if it's Wembley or if it's the pub down the road, you need to put in the same energy. Like, you know, it's, it's, oh, it's, so, it's so great to see bands who like absolutely kill it, no matter if it's three people or 300 people or 3,000 people in the show. I don't, you know, I, I've done shows before. I don't even know what the biggest... I'll Google it because I don't know what the capacity is for the building. That's that's what the problem is. But I know they were at max over max capacity when we were there. But basically, uh, when I was in school, we had an Ulster Scott Society, and then the mayor of Belfast, um, he has like a charity ball every year, and it's all like performances and stuff. And basically, he asked us to go do a performance. So I got to do a solo drum performance, and then I got to do a Collab, like a group thing with like three of us playing Fife and one of the other boys drumming and it was maxed out and I still hold to this dying day that I played the King's Hall in Belfast before the Red Hot Chili Peppers did because they came like six months later and played it <laughs> it's unreal man that's so cool they're blazing that's deadly <laughs> see do you know what I need like a Joe Rogan like a kid to sit beside me and do all my googling for me <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Because it's a bit shit when you're having to Google your own facts on your own podcast. <laughs> Someday, man, keep grinding. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Well, there we go. So the uh, theatre seating alone is 6,974. What? Uh, and the exhibit hall floor is 96,000 square feet. So it was pretty big. Uh, that's a big gig, man. Fair play. I mean, I that's can tell unreal. you now, I don't actually think it was seven fucking thousand people there, to be honest. I think that's a bit... Still a lot, though, you know? Either way, like, you know, even if that's half... Or the story, there was shit loads of people there, and I played it before Red Hot Chili Peppers did, so when... <laughs> that's the important part. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the only important part of the story. <laughs> that's the only fact you gave, man. If that place is empty, it doesn't matter. That's just the only thing you need to say. <laughs> Chron- chronological order comes before everything, mate. That's it. So, have you any other mad stories or funny stories from your gigs? Mad stories? Uh, just drunk people. Just drunk people. <laughs> Doing what? Play free- you're, you're in the middle of a solo or you're in the middle of like playing something. And, and they're like, coming, especially in pubs when you're just doing working gigs. Just, oh, and they like... Yeah, just just drunk people. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, man. I mean, I've worked I've worked in a bar for enough years before all this, so like, I know, I know what they're like. So like, they're just come up. Oh, will you play this for me and this and that and like, yeah, oh, yeah. And you're trying to concentrate, but you're also like trying to be nice to the person, but you're also trying to concentrate on your music and perform at the same time. And you might have to sing too. Oh. Man, <laughs> it's just not as easy yeah. as people think. That's just it, man. Yeah, it's like it's it's a service at the end of the day. Like you know, you're providing entertainment for people who want to be entertained. So that's just it, you know. Yeah. So what what do you think is actually going to end up happening then with the industry? Now, do you see what do you think there's going to be any like massive changes? I definitely think gigs are going to suffer for the time being for the next couple of weeks and months. 
or who knows, you know, but um, like our job is to get lots of people into small rooms and dance and, and you know, <laughs> with all the social distancing thing, like it's, it's not, it's not feasible at the moment. It's not safe to do that. You know, as much as I'd love to get back out and get gigging again, it's just, it's not for the greater good right now, you know? Yeah, that's it. No, no. Here's the hope and like, you know, I, I definitely hope that gigs come back. I hope live music comes back. I hope the whole industry makes it come back and every industry because every industry is suffered. And yeah, I just hope it comes back to some sort of normality where we can just enjoy ourselves and, and be face to face with our friends again and enjoy music. That's the main thing, you know. See, that's the thing. Like I had so much planned for this year. Like obviously I worked, I worked a bar job for five, six years. I don't fucking know at this point, years. and obviously bar job weekends are gone so i haven't me and my missus have spent like two weekends three weekends together maybe in three years together like it's crazy um so this year it was like i was going full time with my agency like i was gonna be working weekends working from home like we were going to be going to all these gigs we were supposed to be going on holidays like we had so much stuff planned and then like all this just kind of shot at the bits and I mean, it's just kind of ruined all like gig plans and like trip plans to go see all these people and all these musicians. And it's just ruined it completely. Definitely. Oh, it's been a nightmare. I, I, like, oh, yeah. Same with us. Like, especially like you said there, with the, it's very unsocial hours working in a bar and same with the music industry. Like for me, with teaching, like all your friends might be in college or in work all day. And then come five o'clock, they're all out of work. They might want to go to the pub or something. But you're like, oh, I, I'm teaching till seven, I'm teaching till eight, I'm teaching till nine o'clock at night or whatever it is. And the same with gigs, like, oh, I'm, my friend's birthday's on Saturday, oh, I can't go up a gig or whatever it might be, you know? It's definitely on social hours. And when you're friends with non-musicians, that could be tough. Yeah. If you're at a partner, that could definitely be tough. Like you said, like if you want to, if you're working the bar on a Saturday, you can't go on date night on Saturday, you know? But, um, yeah, it's definitely tough to, to hold the friendships and hold the relationships when you're when you're actively working in the music industry yeah. because of the unsocial, you know. But, uh, I think people don't realise as well, it's not even just, like you'll probably agree, it's not even just the night, which is the issue, like you can't go and do that. It's the fact that like you live on so much of a different time scale more than everyone else. So even in the day, like they, they're like, oh, you're sleeping all day. And you're like, no, I've been awake all night. Like this is when I sleep. So you don't even get to see the you know your other half or your friends that in daytime because you're sleeping and then you're doing like your morning routine when they're finishing work it's just it just never syncs up together it doesn't really seem to get working 100 percent man especially like even with, it, with the errors and the background stuff that people don't see like if you if you let's say you're, you're getting married right and, and you book a band you see them play from eight o'clock until ten o'clock or ten o'clock till twelve o'clock whatever it might be or same with a pub or whatever but you don't see that Let's say they're playing at eight o'clock. You don't see that they were loading up the van at three o'clock and they had a two hour drive to get there and they set up and they have to set up before the dinner at the wedding. And then they have like two hours to kill when you're all eating dinner and, yeah. and doing stuff. And then they're playing and then they play for two hours, which is what they're getting paid for. And then they have to set up and sound check and then set down and take everything down back into the van and two hour drive home. So you might think that you're only paying people to play for an hour and a half or two hours, but you're paying for an entire day's work. It's a 10 hour shift either way you look at it, you know? Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, I think just I think more places to be fair. So in Swansea, you can see like places are getting a lot better for live music to the point where, you know, they have a lot more set up in terms of in-house equipment, um, even like a mixing desk, so you don't have to like bring as much stuff. I mean, I know one of the bars I worked in, White, um, the bar that I worked in in this, it's it all owned by the same bar, but the top floor was a cocktail bar. And they used to, kind of, the bands would come in through the back door where the alley was, but that was the way the level of ground was, that was down another flight of stairs. So you would have to help them bring in the stuff, come up a flight of stairs from the basement, then go up like a double flight of stairs to get up to the top floor and then they would have to step I mean, you're carrying like speaker amps like you know the equipment all up the stairs and then all back down again yeah exactly and and you should be getting paid for that alone like you know <laughs> let alone playing them yeah it's so obviously um for anyone that doesn't know oh, out there it, it every time you go see a live gig there's a lot more than just the hour and a half there on stage for you. There's, as Kevin says, two hours of travel. There's the packing up. There's making sure they have all their equipment there. Then there's coming, then there's setting up, and then there's waiting to play, and then there's unpacking and then driving home. 
and it's just yeah. a lot more work than it is just standing single. Oh, oh, pay your musicians. Exposure isn't pay. <laughs> pay your musicians with real money. <laughs> Exposure isn't pay for anything. I don't think anyone should ever work do any shit for free. To be honest. Oh, way, man. Yeah, yeah. Especially like people don't even realize it's a specialized skill. It's it's not like I, I can't even. I'm not even going to offend anybody by saying any industry that isn't a specialized skill because every is a specialized skill. Yeah. No matter what you do, so it it is skill, and you need to train for it, whatever it might be. But people don't realize that in order to be a professional working musician, you need to practice for fucking 10 years you know what i mean you need to be practicing especially in college you might be practicing for two three four five six hours a day when you're in in first and second year in college because you need to get the chops up to be able to pass the exams you know and then hours and hours and hours and hours learning songs and hours and hours and hours of practice before you even become a musician to the point where you're good enough to be paid for it you know oh yeah and then you have to go and start so there's like 10 years of background and 10 years of prior experience and 10 years of, of practice and training before you ever get your first gig that you're paid for, you know? It's something people never realize. Like, it's, uh, like when someone says, oh, they were an overnight success. Or something like, like no, one's a fuck, no one's a fucking overnight success. Like you, you say that person was a success, but you didn't see the, you know, the five years they got up at 4 a.m. to get to where they are now. You didn't see the nights that they didn't go to bed. I mean, fucking 50 Cent when he was recording the, it was either the Blood in the Sand, something to do with that album or something like that there. Like, he didn't sleep for, like, 72 hours at one point. He was just, because he was so in the zone. Like, and yeah, I don't yeah, yeah. people don't realize that you aren't an overnight success. Louis Capaldi, everyone was like, oh, he, he came out of nowhere overnight success. But then you don't know about the years he spent from, he was 13, 12, 13, playing gigs in clubs. And learning exactly. and yeah. writing his own songs, and then playing different genres, and then getting to the part to where he can go to, to write that one song which will make him successful. And I don't think people realize music is one of the things that is so, so hard to get into because you have to try so hard and learn so much to get there. For every, for every household name that you know, there's a uh, hundred thousand people who didn't do it, like who didn't make it, you know. And that's if, you, if that is your goal, you know. I think it's definitely it's, it's easier to be a working musician in the industry rather than be a, a household name in the industry you know like they're two completely different sides two completely different different things all together you know lewis capaldi versus being the successful uh music school owner or being the successful uh music producer or being the successful whatever it might be you know and uh, or being the successful crew driver for whatever band you know like that's just as important as yeah. being a household you know the same with songwriters as well it's the same as songwriting. Yeah, Ghostwriter, hundred percent. Oh, definitely. Like without, like I think I can't remember the guy's name. I think it's Max Martin. I could be wrong, but he's written hundreds of number one hits that everyone knows, and it's written by like like by every artist, and mm-hmm. they're all written by like one guy, you know. Yeah. Like like there's a, definitely a, a household songwriters who have dominated the pop industry, like of of radio play, you know. But then they sell out all their songs to all the artists, and and people think, oh. Who, such and such is such a good songwriter, but they don't really realize that they had a team of 10 songwriters writing the song, you know, like with them, you know. But, uh, exactly. Well, I thought that, so like, obviously I'm a massive Garth Brooks fan and like probably most people in my head, I just assumed he wrote all his songs. But then when I watched the Netflix documentary, um, The Road I'm On, which was the Garth Brooks documentary, it was fantastic because, you know, even like his biggest songs, Shameless, Thunder Rolls, The River, The Dance, Rodeo, fucking uh ain't going down to suck all of them he he didn't just write them they were he had ideas and obviously different situations but they were wrote by other people they were other people creating them it's a full like pre-production team like that goes into anything anything major like that because there's so much money at stake you know like people like labels need to make sure that these songs are good you know but uh especially like the original music scene that's not something i know too much about because i haven't spent too much time like like I haven't earned a, a penny in the music in the uh, original music scene, writing my own songs, writing with that. Like when I was in bands, I was just trying to get out and play and have fun and, and learn how to play guitar live. You know, it's completely different than being Lewis Capaldi. You know, like writing your own, recording them, putting them out, and making money off them. But uh, not to say that it's not possible for for smaller people. But again, it's like any business. It's like any anything at all in life. You have to grind and you have to earn your stripes and get up there. You know. I was just about to say it's grinding. It's and I think in the modern day, it really is the social media. Um, and obviously, 
based on what I do, I always bring it back to social media. But um, I think no matter what you want to do, like if you want to be a designer, you want to work in this industry, you want to work in music, everything in this day needs to have a social presence. So no matter what you do, you need to build almost a personal brand around it to get past the, the masses of people that are always going to be there. You need to have that thing that sets yourself apart from everyone else. And I think people don't realize that, you know, yeah, you need to be like yourself, really good at music, but you also have to know how to work within an industry and you have to know how to actually go above everyone else. Definitely. Like you said, like you need to have your own kind of space on social media. You need to cut through the noise quite literally with the music industry. You need to cut, through, you know, like there's so many people who are on social media, on Instagram, especially putting up the 15, 20 second long, minute long videos and they're absolutely killing it. Like they're oh, ridiculous players. But are they playing in the room or are they playing out live and, 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 and working, you know? Like, who knows? But a lot of them have their, their trademark backgrounds, you know, like the, and they have their trademark this and that. They have a trademark guitar that everyone knows when they see that guitar. Oh, that's guy, that guy off Instagram. Yeah. Whatever it might be. But there's so many people who do that and, and they're crazy players. Like, they are ridiculous players. And, oh, they just play us all out of the water any day of the week, you know? But, yeah, uh, Instagram is... It, there's a huge scope. There's a huge reach to just socially prove yourself it's like an online cv there's a guitar player exactly. there's a guitar player called kurt henderson he's a kind of an instagram player he plays with a few few artists around uh he's from america i think but uh i think he was doing an interview with with some company or whatever it might be and he said um the biggest thing you can do if you want like he was talking about uh, um setting up sponsorships and endorsements with companies like with yeah. guitar companies or string companies, whatever it might be and he says the best thing to do is work on your instagram and I, I was thinking to myself, like, oh, why would you do that? Like, you know, like, I, like this is before kind of Instagram, like, blew up for yeah. car players as such, you know. This was a couple of years ago. And I said, well, if you, if you have 10,000 followers as a guitar player and you DM a company on Instagram, you DM a string company or a guitar company or whoever it might be, you're there. That's your social profile is right there. Your CV is right there for them to look at. It's a click away. Whereas if you, like, call the company or cold call the company, like, who the hell's this guy, you know? So definitely social media in the last couple of years is so important for people like that you know exactly exactly man well look uh have you any sort of final thoughts any final tips or hints for anyone wanting to do music uh like i said the first lesson i ever learned in college was don't be a dick so that's the the only that's my final words just be sound you know just be cool don't be a dick be in the room and have fun and enjoy yourself yeah that's it make make good music enjoy yourself have fun that's that's the only thing that matters when you're making music is is enjoying it you know that's it of course well look guys uh, that wraps up for this week uh don't forget come back next week we'll have another guest on the show um i'll not tell you who it is this week but next week we'll have another guest on the show we'll be back for another podcast don't forget if you're listening on itunes spotify podcast republic um we got picked up by google Podcasts this week as well so um yeah, six. So there's like seven new podcast sites that you can catch us on. Uh, the YouTube version will eventually go up when we have sufficient Wi-Fi to get there. Um, as usual, like, subscribe, comment, follow, follow the podcast. Uh, if you want to get me, you can get me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash JT Media Marketing. Uh, Instagram is at underscore Johnny Thompson. Twitter is Johnny X Thompson. And for Kevin, um, I think professionally, as you say, just your Instagram, which would be at Kevin Maxwell Guitarist. That's me. Yeah. That's Thanks so it. much for having me, Johnny. No problem, Kevin. And we'll definitely have you back on the show again at some point. Once all this finishes and we get some gigs going again, uh, we can bring you on and talk about how your gigs have gone and how the industry feels to you now at that point. Hopefully so, man. Can't wait. Thanks awesome. Again, man. Thanks for watching, guys. Catch you next week.